I'm saying hello to everybody. I see Russia, Argentina, Buenos Aires. Uh, I see Bhutan, Lesotho, South Africa, Brazil. Uh, this is really great. And I'm very happy that we have so many people from all over the world here again to our second um, payments dialogue. So what we were trying to prepare for you today was a really dialogue, a real dialogue. So I'm telling you a little bit about what we are doing and then we will start. So what we want to do today is to look at payments from the consumer's perspective. And when I say we, it's not only me, it's Sergey Dukalski from the UPU um, uh, Post Transfer Group and it's me. Sergey is just trying to get online. He had some technical problems. We tried it several times over the last days. It always worked. But today he had a problem. What he is doing actually at the moment, so that you get a feeling for that, Sergey is actually running from room A to room B and he is trying to work out the technical problems. I hope that he is coming online in the next seconds and then this will be a real dialogue. I'm quite sure that we will, we will solve this problem until he is able to come online in the next seconds. So what we want to do is we want to look at how consumers, we all are consumers as well, at how consumers um, on the worldwide basis um, feel about payments, what is changing in the payments market. And we want to really make this a real, real dialogue. Um, what, what do I mean with a real dialogue? We want to have you integrated in this talk and we would like to get you um, really in here. So I will start now with a little bit of background and then we have 12 trends in payments and we would like to um, see that you um, can discuss with us these trends and looking forward to how we can do this. So let's start. Um, evolution and revolution. What we all every day see is that our world is changing quite fast. So we see digital is, the world is getting more digital. We see in more and more virtual events, especially of course in the last year, everything was getting more virtual every day because of this COVID-19 situation. Uh, the world is getting faster. We are all more connected. Just see at this meeting we're in now where we have people from all over the world attending and um uh, okay and uh, we are seeing oops sorry for that glitch uh we are seeing that this is uh, more and more digital connected sometimes it's a little bit scary as well um so we have to find out how to do this world and it is of course much more global and on the other side more comfortable and a lot of things we, we had to pay for in the past, we don't have to pay for anymore today. So it's getting more and more digital. On the other side, if we look at how we pay, we see that this is not at least not changing as fast um, as it was in the past. So um, very often it is still physical. So we, have, we are paying with coins and paying with notes it's not really fast uh, sometimes it's not really safe we have the feeling that the payments are still very national it's sometimes hard to send money overseas uh, what we are seeing as well is that uh, the payments especially if we are sending them overseas are very slow uh, and expensive of course and all of this is often very complicated so um, why is it that and is it really that? Yes, what we see as well is this is changing. We are getting more online payments at the moment. So it's really changing to online. Of course, uh, we're getting more, more mobile payments, which is changing. And then there are coming a lot of new things like, for example, Bitcoins, which weren't there five years ago and suddenly everybody is talking about Bitcoins. So it's really the question of um, how this world is developing and where we are going to. And of course, this changed over the last 12 months even faster. And it will change in the near future as well, very fast. So if you look at, for example, this um, trend, oops, sorry, why is it here? Ah, Sergey is coming online. Give him a second, he will be here in a second. 
Um, Sergey, it's great that you are here. I'm very yes, happy to see you, and I can hear you as well. Yes, so, hello everybody. I really oh. do apologize. As Martin said, I, I was running here and there, but that was literally not from one room to another, but from one building to another building. So okay. Sorry for that. There was a so real fast. Issue. Yeah. So we will go on. I just started with the presentation, Sergey, and we are the next, uh, nearly next thing are the 12 trends. So you are just on time, as it should be. So um, I just were here and telling that especially the cash payments and the digital mobile wallet payments are changing very, very fast over the next years. So the prediction is that cash is nearly half its size. So it's going down from more than 20% to a little bit more than 12% over the next four years. And at the same time, all this stuff, which was cash in the past, is going into the direction of digital and mobile wallets. So this seems to be a very, very fast change in the way we are paying things. Imagine. We paid for with coins now for 4,000, 5,000 years. We paid with banknotes for hundreds of years. And now suddenly within the last some years and the next some years, all this stuff is changing on a really, really fast speed. And this makes the world of payments so interesting. Of course, part of, is, or part of this is COVID-19. And the situation you are seeing here, you saw here, which is a Chinese market probably, you won't see this one in the next future anymore because uh, what you will see is that people are buying things on this market. But what you probably will not be seeing in the future is that the people are paying with cash on these markets. Even there, people will buy and sell and um, pay with mobile phones, even on markets like these. I was in... In China, about 13 months ago, and even the beggars on the street, they had small QR codes where you could pay them um, with, the, with your mobile phone. And if we then look into COVID-19 and how this develops, look at these charts. These two charts show the 10 years development of retail, of e-commerce retail in the US on the left, and e-commerce retail on the, in the UK on the right. And what you're seeing is that the percentage of e-commerce went from 5.6 to 16% or 6.7 to 20% over 10 years. And then suddenly within eight to 12 weeks, these numbers went up to 27 and respectively 33%. So very, very fast, we had a change um, in um, in the way uh, people were were using money and uh, were, were using the internet to sell and to buy things, and um, where we are here we are uh, to buy and sell things and of course to pay differently. So what certainly and I we prepared over the last um, weeks and months even. We prepared and talked and discussed 12 trends in payments. And what we would like to do with all of you now is to really looking into these payment trends, but we would like to do this a dialogue. So I started with some background, but now we want to go in a dialogue. Dialogue means personally two persons, so it would be Sergey and me. But with all of you, it would be probably even more a trialogue. So we would like you to really go into this and ask your questions or give your comments or show us your examples from your countries. As we cannot put everybody on speaker and, and uh, video, just put something in your comments. I always have a view on the comments and can um, always uh, give you uh, the word. And it would be great to see you integrated in this discussion over the next half hour. Of course, we can answer questions. But if you have a different opinion, if you see a trend differently than us, please integrate yourself into this discussion and into this dialogue. So, Sergey, are you ready? Then we should start. Yeah, let's start. I was late. Let's anyway. start. No time. To then open. let's start with trend number one. Trend number one, I think we both see, and we probably don't have that big difference here, is that the the way payment goes is to be a cashless world. 
So there won't be any more physical assets like coins, notes, money is getting virtual. We see this in the real world examples outside of payment, for example, with virtual reality, augmented reality. And we see this in payments, which are getting more and more payments, uh, getting cashless. cashless. The first countries like Denmark, Sweden, Norway are expected to be nearly cashless within the next five years. So I was in Sweden about one and a half year ago. I was there for two or three days. I, I didn't even change money at the airport. I've spent everything I spent there in Sweden. I spent online mo mostly with Apple Pay, sometimes with a credit card, but no cash anymore. We see it in, in the cash. I just showed you the, the cash at uh, the payments in COVID-19 phases worldwide. We see that the cash at the POS at the point of sale in stores went down from 32% to 20.5% 20, 20 uh, within one year over the last 12 months. And I, we found, for example, a, a, a market research from India where people um, over the age of 56 told that they use the payments, online payments, more often after COVID-19 than before. So what we really see here is a big change in consumer behavior to a cashless world. What do you think, Sergey? Right? Or do we have a disagreement here? Well, I can't disagree here with you, Martin, because I would even state that it's not the trend, it's already the reality. And uh, what I can say is that the only limitation for now for people is that they need to have an account. So either a banking account or a mobile whatever account. And that leads to um, some issues with uh, know your customer and AML, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and even today, well, with the mobile penetration, uh, you have a phone. Well, almost everybody has a phone, and um, it seems to be quite easy to ever evolve it. Uh, but still, there are some financially excluded people, and they are not able to to use the the cashless um, cashless society. What, what I wanted to say, and you mentioned it in your introduction, actually, is that uh, what can be the trends, that's the emerging of the cryptocurrencies. Uh, everybody is talking about them. Uh, probably some of you who are attending the webinar already bought some. Uh, hmm. But there is still an absence of the national or what is even more important, international um, uh, regulations on that. And until we have um, it in place, and of course, until we have a central clearinghouse uh, to monitor those cross-border currency flows, uh, that will be still a challenge to have these yep. non-convertible ones. I agree with that one. Coming back to our second trend, uh, which is instantly. So money payments are getting well, not only faster, but they are getting instantly. So uh, when I was young and we had to send money, I had to, to, with a bank account, I had to walk to the bank. I had to fill out with a pen my, my, my transfer. They had to scan it or to, to type it into their systems. Then they made the transfer and then somebody else could go to his bank and to find out whether he has the money on the account. And often this took a week. So nowadays we are down to, let's say, a day normally within Europe or within other countries, maybe two days sometimes, internationally a bit, a bit longer, national even faster. But what we think, uh, Sergey and me, is that this is going to get even faster in the next time. So we are getting down to hours, minutes, or even instantly, seconds, you will need to, to make a pens transfer payment which changes, of course, our world as a consumer very, very much. Yeah, absolutely true, Martin. Uh, just to add on top of what you said, uh, I would say that technology-wise, uh, it's pretty easy. It's already here. So you can do the transfer in a second. Uh, but the hindering part, uh, again, as I mentioned before, are compliance rules. You have to do the ML and um, CFT checks for all digital transaction. And well, that's normal in our world. So uh, how do you see it with post transfers? This one got, in, got faster as well? Yes, absolutely. So UPU itself uh, responded to that trend. Uh, previously, we had the outgoing EDI technology. 
and uh, money transfers were sent within three days. Now with the new post transfer and um, uh, UPUIP platform, everything is done in seconds. Well, there is of course some literacy um, of like latency of two hours, but that's mainly due to the capacity of DOs to connect uh, to the system and pick up pick up the money order. So, so you guarantee you the, the payment connection. within two hours. Well, it's even less. Again, technically wise, it's done within seconds or minute uh, maximum. It's more yeah. what kind of connection do you have to grab the payments okay. uh, through the centralized system. So this is a big change in the speed of the payments. The yeah. next one, I think this one is a very interesting one and it's probably for the established players the hardest change one of the hardest changes we see we see it in every real world examples as well so if you look at for example postal mails who got substituted by a lot of at least partly substituted by email uh, you paid quite some money for a postal mail you are paying nearly nothing for an email so the the marginal cost of an email is zero and what Sergey and I have found as one of the big trends in payments is that we are seeing a similar trend in payments. So, for example, if you look in, in the past, a payment transfer with a credit card, this one cost about, for a $100 credit card payment, it cost about $2.70, uh, $2 so about 2.7%. 2, 2 but if you do the same now in China, for example, with Alipay or v, with WeChat, you are paying not two dollars seventy, but um, zero dollars seventy. So it's it's getting much much cheaper, and as, as well, especially if you do this in as a person as a consumer, you sometimes even can send money for free. So if I send some some hundred euro to Sergey via PayPal, and I say it's a transfer to a friend, I do not pay one cent of cost. So. The, the amount of money you have to pay for payments, it's getting smaller and smaller, right, Sergey? Absolutely, but you will still have some marginal costs. And, um, well, you, for example, you have the Revolut model. Uh, they actually don't charge you that much for each transaction, uh, but they have some kind of a monthly fee which you have to pay or limitations in the number of transactions which you can do uh, through the months. So even if the payment is somehow getting cheaper and cheaper, but you have to pay something in addition, either for receiving a, a card or for just having the possibility to do the transfers. And uh, what I wanted to say, you, you, you put an example of email. Of course, email itself is for free. Well, you, you don't need to pay um, as long as you, as you have connection and electricity. But sometimes you need to uh, have this email physical. So, and then mm -hmm. the cost comes, like paper, printing, ink, and stuff like this. It's also marginal, but it's the cost. And here I make connection to the uh, cryptocurrencies and the payments which are done in, in cryptocurrencies. Everybody uh, thinks that it's also almost for free because, well, you, you, you don't have uh, real, real, real costs. You just transmit some virtual uh currencies but it's good until it's in the crypto environment but when you want to cash out when you want to get a fiat money instead of crypto you have mm -hmm. to pay quite a lot of costs yes i absolutely agree and i think there's another similarity if you look for it from a not from a consumer's perspective from a but from a company's perspective even sending emails is not free so if you send out 10,000 or 100,000 emails from a company, you still have to pay a little bit for that to send it out, to, to make it happen and to have your provider organizing all that stuff. So it's not free, but it's of course much cheaper than sending out mails. And I think this is another similarity that companies might still have to pay for payments a little bit at least, uh, but for consumers, the feeling getting is getting more and more that for from a consumer's perspective payments are getting free or nearly free in the future or are already there that's interesting i just saw a message from rodrigo from uh, from let's see brazil 
And he said, Pix is, uh, is started to work in Brazil and is instantly between any bank account and any day of the week. So Pix seems to be a, um, a free and instantly service between the banks in, in Brazil. So yes, so thanks to Rodrigo for that message. Uh, it's getting worldwide, this instantly and uh, free payments. So one other thing I think which is really interesting is it's getting easy, easier, much. Ah, we get, sorry for that. It's, it's free sustainable. David from UPU is asking, is free sustainable? Banks are impacted by the drop of interest rates. If payments become free, how will they transform their business model? In addition, in Europe, the idea of taxing financial transactions is making its way. I think, Daniel, that's a very, very important question about how can can companies still live if, or banks can still live, or payment companies can still live if, uh, if the payment itself is free? Sergey, what are your ideas on your thoughts on this um, comment well, from David? I, I don't have the di direct answer, of course, and I don't know what banks are thinking about, but one of the models can be the uh, data sharing. Uh, when the uh, banks themselves or the companies providing the payments, they will agree with their customers that uh, they will share their data for uh, uh, any kind of marketing um, uh, purposes and that they will offer in addition um, other services to these customers. So the data sharing, uh, that can be one of the ways out. I think this is interesting. I see, for example, telecom providers doing the same thing. Uh, they don't make much money anymore with a, with a tele mobile um, service as well uh, itself. But for example, they start to sell the data from the mobile users, how they walk around or drive around so that other companies can start to make a usage of this uh, usage data and, and to see, for example, where a traffic jam is building up or something like that. So I think this is this is a, a good example. It's another one I think, uh, especially to, to do with data as well. If we are looking for free, is that companies might try to sell extra services to their their uh, to their customers. So the payment itself might be free, uh, but only a number of payments a month, or only up to a certain amount, or only up to a certain speed. And the moment you want to have a special speed or a special payment or a special security, for example, then you might have to pay a little bit more or even pay a little bit or even a little bit more because of this service. I think this might be another way of still earning money. But uh, I think uh, um, this is a good point David made there. We will coming to the point competition a little bit later on because that is one of our trends we are seeing as well. And we might talk to that one as well. Um, Igor from Russia is questioning, Sergey, whether UPU is going to create their own payment system. That's a question, especially for you. Well, but that, that's already a reality. UPU has its own system for, for payments. Uh, we, well, we provide it under brand post transfer and that's already in place for more than 20 years. And Russia is part of it. Russian Post is part of it. That's a good news, Igor. You should try to talk with Sergey about it. But if you don't know it, you might be able to use it from now on. That's great. Um, the next one is easy. And I think that is one is interesting as well. Uh, because from a consumer perspective, payment is always a little bit complicated. If I go into a supermarket and in front of me is a queue with people, I always have the one in front of me who is trying to pay with cent coins or something like that and is, is collecting the money for, I feel, ha half an hour to make a payment. So I, if I go there, I just go there with my mobile phone and hold it in front of the RFID thing. And then it's about, well, I would say my payment doesn't take longer than 10 seconds probably, even with, with putting in my PIN code. So it's much more easy for me as a consumer to do a one-click purchase like it's done with Amazon or like an RFID thing. Um, I think this one is going to be much more easier in the future. I think, Sergey, when we talked about it, you talked about QR codes as an example for that. Yeah, well, and you mentioned already uh, QR codes used by beggars. 
uh, that's the easiness of, of the payment solution. I just wanted to make uh, a comparison which has a kind of a side effect. Well, in the past, and well, some people even know, uh, when they were carrying cash, uh, they were able to spend only what they had in their pocket or what they have in their pocket right now. Well, when you use digital, well, credit cards or any other means, uh, at the end, you spend as much as you want and you are just limited to, to the limit on your credit card. So you don't really feel and see what you are spending. And that's mm -hmm. a kind of a side effect of all this. Uh, but of course, well, the easier the payment is, the, the better. That there will always be some kind of a, uh, security issues, uh, but we'll come, I think, to, to this a bit later. Max. Security is one of our other trends. There's an interesting comment. Uh, there's one comment from the Iraq. We need UPU support, Iraqi posts, and payment systems. So, Sergey, I think that's one you can do after this talk. You can call them and try to help them. I think that might be interesting. The other one is coming from Igor, which is interesting how PostTransfer could connect post logistics and modern payment technologies. I think that one is interesting because, well, that's what posts are connecting. Can you connect logistics uh, with payment systems? Is there some way in there? Well, it depends what Igor means, but uh, you, you already has in place the uh, cash on delivery service, and that's integrated into post transfer. So once you receive a parcel, you can pay uh, for that e-commerce item, and that's already there. So if oh, Igor, that's interesting. Yeah, if Igor is talking about any kind of taxes to be paid to the customs and other providers, that still has to be developed. Yeah, but I think this integration with the parcels is quite interesting. Uh, maybe it's the other way around as well. So nowadays I go to a post office to pay for post transfer to send money. Maybe I can do it uh, with the with the uh, with the person coming to my home as well. So there might be other possibilities in the future to integrate these services. Interesting thought. Which comes to our next one, our trend number five, automated, which is going. Um, um in, in, into into something which is interesting i th i think from a payments perspective at the moment most of our payments are done manually i read about the us where they sent out these uh, checks for covid-19 relief and these were checks they sent out with postal and they sent them to the persons and they had to go with a check to their bank and to cash that check I think there might be in the future different systems which are a little bit more automated than this. So if you look for, for other examples like Uber or Amazon Go or so where you shop without any problems, go through a cashier and this moment you're going out of the store, you already paid. This is much more automated. Um, and I think um, you have some ideas about that from a, from a UPU's perspective as well, Doesn't, don't you, Sergey? Uh, not, not, not really from the UPU perspective, but as you said, quite a lot of uh, automated payments are already available. So, well, we use them monthly. That's all the sus subscriptions for the mobile applications, whatever you use. If you use any kind of fitness app for which you have to pay each month, well, the money are deducted automatically. Well, Netflix sus subscription or any kind of regular charity payments which you are subscribed for, uh also martin we discussed with you that uh there are quite a lot of transport application for example mm -hmm. swiss sbb um they already have a feature in their app which automatically deducts the amount whenever you hop on hop off the train so you don't even need to buy a ticket everything is done automatically according to your route so I just have my smartphone with me, hop on the train and go off somewhere else and the train detects me and then he knows where I yep. hopped on, hopped off and so he knows, okay, I have to buy, what is it, Swiss francs, five Swiss francs or 10 Swiss francs or something like that. I, I, I think this is a very interesting thing because I saw that in London, for example, with the London Tube. If you go on there uh, and you go on there once and you pay whatever, two two euros or something like that, or two pounds probably in London. And then you use the tube on the same day the next time and you pay another two pounds. And when you do it the third time, 
the system automatically detects that you are using the cube for the third time and that it's cheaper for you to pay for a day pass instead of single fares. And then the system tells me, okay, you just have to pay one more pound and then you have a day pass and you can hop on and hop off as you want. And I really like that system because normally as a consumer, you always have to decide in the morning, will I do two or three or four fa uh, fare times in the tube? And then you have to decide whether to use a day pass or not. With this system, it's really comfortable and very easy to have this automated. I think there's a lot of stuff in there for payments in the future. Yeah, and I think, Martin, you already introduced the new, uh, the next trend, which is intelligent, because yeah. that's exactly what, uh, what it stays for. Yeah, I think this is very interesting that, that payments going to be intelligent in the future. Uh, we will have a lot of more, more predictive banking. We will have fraud detection with, with intelligent systems, artificial intelligence, chatbots. So I could say, Alexa, please do something. Please pay Sergey five euros and then uh, he gets the money instantly. So I think this will be the world we are going into the future. So the grandma can send the, the, the money to their grandchildren via, via systems like Alexa or something else. So I think there's really something in, in intelligent systems here. Yeah, absolutely. And your behavior, your daily behavior, as you mentioned with the London Tube, will be used to propose or to ease up somehow uh, the gathering information for your payments. Either it's a train ticket or, well, the route proposed or any kind of recurrent payments. If you are used to pay your utility bills every month on last Thursday of the month, so then the system can, like two days before, uh, send you a push notification uh, that the payment is due in two days, and either either you confirm it or just cancel. So it's that it, would be interesting, here. yeah, yeah, and very comfortable again. So these trends are a little bit connected as well, yeah. I think that's interesting. Then we have the next trend, which is borderless, and I think we already got some questions on that one. So for example, on um, how to enforce the government to start the payments or to, to how to do that, uh, how, how governments are going about regulating financial institutions, institutions and cryptocurrencies. So we already got some questions uh, for that. And I think they are not, not right and uh, not wrong. Uh, I think there will be some more regulation maybe in the future. But on the other side, um, I think it's much easier to send money internationally than it was in any time in the human history. So when I wanted to send money from Greece to Rome 2000 years ago, so it was quite, quite complicated. Nowadays, it's, it's gotten much easier than it was in the past. Maybe it's not borderless yet, but I think we are on the way to yes. And, it, and I have the feeling um, in the future, it might not even be any more questions whether I pay from Moscow or from, from Rome or from New York and my money will just go where it needs to be. Don't you think so, Sergey? Yeah, and, and again, when you travel, when you pay for, um, uh, for your hotel or you pay for your utility bills, like I'm doing being here in Switzerland, but paying my utility bills still in Moscow, I can do it from here without any borders. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I have the same feeling. I just did a transaction a year ago I was, I don't know, I think I was in Singapore or Thailand. I was in Bangkok actually. Uh, and I had to pay something. I just could do it on my smartphone without a problem. But actually I used the German system to send a money in German. So I just, I wasn't in Thailand, but I just used the German system. I think what is still has some way to go are real international payments. So when I had to pay, for example, for the, for the student fees for my, my sons in Canada, that was quite costly. I think I paid about 200 euro or 250 euros to, to send the money to Canada. That was quite costly. So it wasn't free. It was, I was able to do it and it was fast, but it wasn't yet free. So I think on the, on the payment side or on the, on, the, on the cost side, borderless is still quite expensive if you compare it to national payments. Yeah, of course. Well, the, the international payments are much more expensive than the domestic ones. That's Do you think that's, that this will change? Will international payments getting cheaper as well over time? Yes, and a uh, good example for that is somehow the European regulations on the freedom of 
move of goods and people. So Good that's point. where the, the, the whole world is going. So, yeah, absolutely. Coming to trend number, oh, sorry, yes, eight, which is secure. We think that uh, the, the 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 current experience is that a lot of people are afraid of losing money. I know if I go to a, to a foreign city, I always get to, I try to get whether I have my money still with me. I'm always a little bit unhappy to have the money with me. Uh, so um, what we saw, for example, in Sweden, um, Sweden is, uh, was in 1661 the first country with banknotes. And now it seems to be to get the first country without bank robberies because uh, due to having no cash anymore in Sweden, the, the, the amount of bank robberies went down from 110 in 2009 to 11 in 2017 and probably zero in 2025. So it seems to be that um, money gets more secure. On the other side, we are seeing this cybercrime trends. So, Sergey, is money, is, is cash more secure or is cyber money more secure? What do you think? I would say that security uh, is always an issue, uh, regardless of the way of, of payment or storing the money. So, for example, there was last year, and I think it continued this year, there was a wave of uh, banking safe deposit boxes robberies in Russia. So, just the, mm. the deposit boxes were robbed in the banks. But on, on the other end, according to the Cifra Trace uh, cryptocurrency crime and anti-money laundering report, uh, it was revealed that last year um, frauds and thefts, uh, thefts totaled almost two billion. Two billion? Yeah, two billion USDs. And, that's quite and, an amount of money yeah and uh, what i think is actually that society itself we all are more familiar with the physical robberies and we're not yet ready to provide really response to digital ones and, and they yeah. are not as visible probably if a bank robber goes into a bank and robs it it's very visible and it will be in the news if somebody has some cyber crime, it normally doesn't make the news, at least mostly if it's not a very big case. So it's, it's probably more under the water surface. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the answers to, 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 to this uh, can be uh, a digital, digital identity. Uh, ah. for, yeah, for prevention of the crimes. Because once you have it, all the transactions are done under your digital ID. But for that, there should be really developed an international legislation because now uh, there is nothing in place. Some countries are working towards uh, that direction, uh, but all efforts um, should be put together to develop really a comprehensive international one. I think this is a good point. And this point brings us to the next trend we are seeing, which is money transfers getting more transparent. Transparent, and I think um, when we discussed that in the beginning, um, we talked that this is a little bit uh, double-sided or double-folded word, because on one side, of course, it's very great to have good transparency in this, and I know where I spend my money. For example, I if I if I use my smartphone and Apple Pay, I always have the list of the last transfers I made, so it's very easy and very transparent. On the other side, if I do some, well some not so special activities i don't want anybody to know about I, I don't talk about going to sex shops of course but let's talk about i'm buying the present for my wife and she shouldn't know about what i'm buying her uh, the transparency is not as good and i know for example that in germany the purchase of gold uh, is now you're not able to purchase gold anymore if you don't id yourself above a certain amount uh, so there is getting more and more transparency into these payments. And if you if we go into the direction you just said that we do the payments with our IDs, then every single cent we have or get and spend will be connected to our IDs. And this will be a very transparent system, won't it? Yeah, well, it would for sure. But as you said, it's double folded. Who wants to have this transparency? Either it's a regulator and of course, they will go for a total transparency of each and every uh, transaction due to any kind of uh, taxation issues or 
CFT ones. While you as a customer, as you rightly pointed out, probably do not need that kind of transparency. So again, uh, who will win this fight? So you think that the states, the nations, the tax, the tax, uh, tax getters are more interested in this transparency than the consumers probably? I think so, because look, we had offshores in the past. So people were trying to hide somehow money over there. Uh, now we are going uh, towards DLTs and cryptocurrencies, which people also think to be uh, more secure and more private. Uh, but each and every time governments come with uh, additional and new regulations to make it more transparent and more according to the laws, which is, yeah. of course, is the right thing to do. We got an interesting question from Rodrigo. He said, who do you think has to be responsible for the client money in a digital robbery, the bank or the client? Ooh. Good, good question. Well, looking at, at the current situation, uh, bank is always putting the responsibility towards the customer. Of course, they can cooperate and help somehow. But usually if you made it, well, if somebody has stolen your credit card and uh, paid with it in a shop, uh, at least uh, the cases I know, that usually it's your responsibility, especially if you report late. Yeah, so in that case, I, I think there are not only orders like 100 euro or 150 euro to it. So the first 150 euro gotten spent you are responsible for and everything above the, the company is responsible for something like that, which is interesting as well. So some kind of shared responsibility. And I think in the end, it's like that. It's, it's the shared responsibility. Um, so the bank, of course, has some, some responsibility to the customers. Uh, on the other side, of course, the customers have some responsibility themselves not to share their pins or doing things like that. Uh, to make it very easy for 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 um, robbers, yeah. Our next trend uh, coming to well, we have to come to the end. Is trend number ten, which is competitive. I think we already touched that one a little bit earlier when we talked about new companies coming into the market. When we talked about free payments, and we are seeing suddenly companies like Apple, like Alibaba, like WeChat, Tencent coming into the payment marketing where they have never been. They these are not banks. But now they are suddenly in the payment market and they, they don't earn their money with, with, with bank transfers, with payments. They are earning their money with uh, selling goods or selling computers or doing things like that. So they don't have the real, the real need to earn money with payments. So suddenly they make the payments free. So do you think that the, the money payment market will get more competitive in the next years that there will be new players coming along Sergey? yes i think well the new place will come for sure uh it won't be more and more competitive of course even if competitive enough already now and everything um what we have now is due to the uh, digitalization itself and the emerging of fintech companies because when they came to the market and um they offered their, their, their solutions. Uh, with that, they load down the prices of transactions. They come up with new ideas, new developments, and everything um, they did. Well, it, it, actually, it's all interconnected. Well, it's the easiness of the payment, it's automation of the pay payment, it's intelligence of the payment. And so I can just repeat and repeat all these trends, uh, and all this is part of the competitive of, uh, competitiveness yeah. of the market. And there will, will always be new players having some more comfort, having it faster, having it cheaper, whatsoever. So this will make, yes, I agree with you, it will be more and more uh, competitive. The next one is connected. I think this is very interesting. Uh, more not, not so much from the consumer's point of view, but in the background, as the, the postal view, the, the e-commerce view, that all these payment systems will be connected to stores I think the future will be that these payment systems will be even connected to things. So the moment, uh, whatever, your laser printer is needing new, um, new toner, new, new ink, 
that he himself can buy this ink because you gave him some money for his yearly ink allowance or something like that. So he needs, he is connected to the payment system and he automatically not only buys the ink, but pays for the ink. So I think that there will be a lot of more connections, interfaces, APs, application programming interfaces in the background, which makes in there from the front end view, from the consumer point of view, makes it much easier to use the systems. And again, we are in trends like comfortable and, and so on. Yeah, absolutely, Martin. And UPU, of course, uh, is eager and able to play a role of such kind of a hub for various payment system so that to connect the whole world and to provide fast um, and secure service. And it can be done both for remittances themselves as the core mandate of the UPU and of course for e-commerce payments as it was asked um, in the chart. Yeah. But uh, it's also it's also interesting somehow, Martin, to look from the uh, consumer's perspective uh, customer and consumer perspective because I don't think that technology is really a barrier here for for the connection and interconnection it's more about the legal barriers and mm. somehow the demand for uh, accessible and democratic devices so that you can ex you can have access to financial services and accounts itself and that's again where the role of the EPU it's really crucial and where we have to be uh, engaged uh, either through the financial inclusion projects which we are delivering mm -hmm. in the countries and by providing the uh, financial education to people yeah either by leveraging the the post transfer payments experience which we have uh, now or uh, through the access to the technology that's our key role here I totally agree with you, which brings us to our last trend, number 12, inclusion. And I just saw a comment from Kenneth or a question. He's, he's saying in developing countries, access, access and ownership of a bank account is very low. Conversion to digital money and then payments to selected vendors is the workaround. Any initiatives through UPU to reach this group? And I think then we are actually directly at inclusive, something which is, I think, very important for UPU to include more and more participants in the market, consumers into, into the payment systems. Like MPSA is done in, in Eastern Africa, for example, with their accounts. Uh, what are you, are you planning actually at the moment at UPU to be more inclusive? Um, how many countries are you working with your post-transfer system now? Well, post-transfer is uh, mainly for payments, for remittances, Martin. Uh, we have like 76 countries, but I think what, what is asked for, what actually UPU is doing to uh, um, help with the financial inclusion issue. And here we're working together with uh, our donors, uh, namely uh, Visa and Bill and Millie and the Gates Foundation, uh, and they sponsor quite a number of projects in various countries. Uh, to help those unbanked uh, and people without uh, access to financial services uh, through the post. Uh, going into digitalization of these services and um, providing them access to. That's great. That's a good example. Thanks a lot, Sergey. So uh, we Thank came to a little bit of the end. Um, just as a summary, these were our 12 trends the two of us are seeing. And thanks not only to you, Sergey, but thanks a lot to all the others who asked, started to ask questions. There are still coming more questions. So I think we will be online, Sergey, to answer some more. Uh, but before that, I would like to thank you uh, to everybody that you paid attention, that you were attending this event. And sorry once again for that we start a little bit late. For a German like me, this is a horrible thing to start five minutes late. I hope you will excuse this. And I promise that next time we do a session like this, we will be on time again. And uh, But there are coming questions. So for example, we have here Magrub Ahmed. He is asking how to develop an international regulatory framework in the near future. So going to what you just said, Sergey that regulation is sometimes the barrier we have to tackle. Yes, but that again depends uh, what kind of regulations is mentioned here, because 
UQ's main mandate so far is only for postal payment services, meaning the, let's call them remittances from post to post. And the rest is either to central banks or the World Bank itself. Uh, what we have to think about is how UPU can be involved in the development of payments and financial services at a whole in the future, and whether there is interest of the postal stakeholders, both regulatory authorities and post themselves, in having their say in, in that domain. That's what we have to answer to ourselves. Interesting, very interesting point. Wonderful. Uh, I see that some of you are typing. So I would say officially, Sergey, shall we close it and say thank you for everybody? And um, beside of that, I think we can still stay online for some, some minutes. If anybody has a question he wants to ask uh, or wants to get in contact. Um, so some of you have special questions and Sergey, I'm quite sure that you are always open for an email and answer yeah. that. I just saw that Rodrigo has already said he wants to say he sent an email. I think that's great. So thank you to everybody. A special thanks, Sergey, to you for doing a dialogue with me. I hope you in the audience, you like this kind of dialogue. And um, yes, Sergey, you just, just put in your email address so everybody can find you. Great. So I hope that everybody liked your our dialogue, liked the way we were not just doing a presentation, but doing a little bit of discussion around it. And we wish you a very happy day, or well, depending on where you are, evening, morning, afternoon, whatsoever, and having a great time. And Sergey, I think we will be back with the next payment dialogue in one or two months. Yeah, and um, we are looking for a good, good, interesting topic. But I'm quite sure that we will find one. We maybe use one of the 12 ones and just make a whole session on free or a whole session on secure. I think there's a lot of stuff in that. So thanks everyone all over the world and goodbye from Sergey and me. Yeah. Goodbye everybody. Bye bye.